we have a new target, the snowy grouper rat. Today, marine biologist and explorer Mike Barnett and his team of elite divers are investigating a case where history and science fiction may collide. Called the Snowy Grouper Wreck, it's one of the targets on Barnett's closely guarded map. It's 45 miles off the coast of southern Florida, sitting at a depth that is out of reach for most divers. It's uh, about 360 foot of water, so it's a deep, deep dive. So you gotta be on our A game here. I mean, the depth and the current usually is enough to <laughs> dissuade any- Who's gonna go dive that? Yeah. Any sane person would not be doing that. There's been a lot of vessels and a lot of aircraft in particular that have gone missing in this area. On August 28th, 1963, two U.S. Air Force stratotankers based out of Homestead, Florida, are deep inside the triangle on a mission. Stratotankers are like flying gas trucks designed to deliver fuel mid-air to bombers and fighter planes. You had one that was flying at 36,000 feet, and you had the second aircraft that was flying at 35,500 feet, so 500-foot separation. And then the next moment, they hit a low-pressure system in the Bermuda Triangle. Both tankers inexplicably drop out of radio contact. We knew where they were at. And then the next moment, all contact was lost. Those aircraft were not recovered. No one knows what happened to those aircraft. Dozens of planes and ships are sent by the military to search for the missing refuelers. But neither aircraft nor the bodies of 11 crew members are ever found. Barnett thinks the snowy grouper wreck could be one of the stratotankers, or pieces of both. Dad, dad, dad. As soon as they reach the ocean floor, their clock begins. But as we got towards the bottom, we realized visibility was starting to close in on us. It was getting murkier and murkier. The viz is that bad right now. We could just barely see each other. It's dark, it's murky. I can't see anything. I can't see my hand in front of my face. Then they find what they're looking for. We saw what looked to be the edge of the left wing, and we saw two masses that were the engines. So it indicates this is a large aircraft, four engines. But what kind of aircraft it is, we don't know yet. The plane's size and multiple engines are similar to the missing stratotankers, but the murky darkness makes a positive ID difficult. We saw a very large aircraft, four engines, the wings were intact. We also noticed Daglo orange color, which is a fairly common pattern used by the US Air Force for visibility for refueling aircraft that led me to believe this is potentially a military aircraft. Time's up. Two hours later, they reach the surface. Back on shore, Jason Harris, military historian David O'Keefe, and historical investigator Wayne Abbott join Barnett to break down the footage to see if there are clues connecting it to the two missing stratotankers. What is it right there that we see? So we're seeing some debris here. We're on the periphery of this aircraft. Again, we see the large fuselage. Civilian, military, do we know? Yeah, I would lend to believe this would most likely be military. This is 40, 50 miles offshore. There's a lot of military training going on out here. So how long do you think it's been down here? That'll help us narrow down the era that we're working on. This is a large aircraft. I'm thinking it might be post-World War II. It gives a vibe off maybe the 50s into the 60s. The wreck is looking more and more like Barnett's suspect, one of the two military refueling aircraft, or maybe parts of both. And we saw this one hatch over the wing that was open. If an aircraft goes down, it's likely that that hatch would have not been open prior to going down. When the stratotankers disappeared in 1963, not only were the two planes never found, no bodies were found either. So if the crew bailed out, what happened to them? These doors won't spontaneously open on their own. I mean, this has to be opened by someone. So that kind of is a tantalizing clue. With little else to go on, poor visibility and limited bottom time, the team agrees that a follow-up dive is crucial. Jason Harris has tracked down an existing stratotanker. He wants to study the plane's features to help Barnett and Jimmy ID the wreck on their next dive. This model predated the stratotanker and was dubbed the Stratofreighter. 
You're looking at a genuine vintage KC-97, all original. This is built as a propeller-driven aircraft, and you can visually see how it would be much slower and fly much lower. You look at this, it's very bulbous, straight wing, rounded vertical fin, bulbous nose on it. The bulbous nose with a face that only a mother could love. Meanwhile, following up on the clues he saw at the Castle Air Museum, Jason has found something. Been doing a little bit of digging, and I came across a very interesting article about a KC-97 accident that crashed or it ditched in the ocean. What do you think? Position sounds about right. This is definitely a lead we need to run down. A KC-97 Stratofreighter went down in the Bermuda Triangle in 1960, three years before the tankers went missing. And that's not all. There were 14 crew members on board. They ditched this aircraft into the Atlantic Ocean. There were 11 survivors of that accident. It's been, what, 60-some years, but there's a chance with that many survivors that we could luck out and find someone. That'd be huge. That personal narrative would be invaluable. So what's your game plan, then? So I think getting down there, analyzing the wreck in a little more detail, I think we'll be able to narrow it down even more on second dive. Dive, dive, dive. With only five minutes remaining, clues finally start to surface that could help the team identify the wreck. And as we got to the cockpit, which was totally intact, we noticed one window was kicked out as if the crew was trying to escape a sinking wreck. I've been seeing the nose of the aircraft, seeing that day glow orange, seeing all the windows. It's almost like a figure eight bubble hull on the fuselage. And that was unique. It looks like a face only a mother could love. But it's what the divers find next that offers the biggest leads yet. It looked like it had some kind of engines on the wings that had props connected to them at one point in time. But time's up. The divers start their ascent. Barnett and the dive team believe they've finally documented the proof to identify the mystery tanker. Looking at all the details, you see that it's a military aircraft. It's a four-engine propeller-driven aircraft. Everything points to the third missing tanker aircraft that the team uncovered late in their investigation. We were able to correlate that this was the Stratofreighter from the accident in March of 1960. We have all the features on the wreck that line up with the accident report. This is a KC-97 Stratofreighter. This is amazing. Well done, boys. And then an unexpected addition to the story. One of the Stratofreighter's surviving crew heard about the dive. I was quite shocked and stunned that an actual survivor reached out to me and saying, that's my aircraft. Jason and Mike jump at the chance to fill in the missing parts of the story. Mike Barnett. Hi, nice, nice to meet you. you. Barnett and Jason are meeting with Marshall Taft. His 85-year-old father was on the Stratofreighter that ditched off the coast of Florida in 1960. It was a pretty scary night. Uh, there was plane was bouncing around, there was lightning, and you could see the, the wing. Joe Taft is one of 11 who survived. Sadly, three airmen did not. After reaching out, the elder Taft has declined to appear on camera, instead letting his son tell the story. You know, the plane was just bouncing all over the place. He'd never felt it like that before. He talked about looking out the windows of the aircraft and seeing the wings bouncing up and down and basically flapping. He called it like a duck wing. Oh, wow. We went out through a hatch over the wing and jumped off the forward edge of the wing. I'm seeing the escape hatch open where Joe actually evacuated the aircraft. It just, it's unbelievable. How did your dad end up being by himself? He inflated his one-man life raft. They were going to try to tie them together, but before they could get together, he had drifted away, so he was by himself. 
finally, an oil tiger comes to his rescue. He's the last one saved. Usually, when I'm diving an unidentified shipwreck, once I identify it, I feel my task is done. But then your father pulled me back into it. I wanted to learn about his experience, and that's just been an amazing journey. Dad had told us various things over the years, but, you know, I just always wanted to know more. What, what else is out there? It feels way more complete now. I appreciate you just taking this time to share this with us, Ben. Thank you for being willing to just have this conversation, because it means a lot.